Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's study in our morning studies. And um, we're going to continue uh, laying uh, down this line of Samson. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have to study each morning. And we ask for your Holy Spirit's presence as we open your word together. Help us to understand the things we read, correct our understanding where it is faulty. And uh, we pray, Lord, for each person. We all face struggles in this world of sin and suffering. And um, the challenges of each day uh, require our dependence and trust in you. And um, Lord, we know that uh, the enemy seeks to discourage us. We just pray that you can encourage each one. Help us to have the patience that is required and to have the faith and trust in you. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Now, um, we did draw out the line of Samson, at least dealing with uh, um, the arrival of the first, second, and third angel's messages, as long as with the empowerment of and, and formalization of the first two. Now, we also, of course, have chapter 16, and we started, um, we didn't put the verse verses that match with everything on our chart, so we're going to have to do that today. Now, we had, because we've gone through Samson so many times, but I know not, not everybody who's watching this video will have seen all of the other videos, so we probably should just go through uh, chapter 15 here a little bit, uh, just refers, re review some of these things. Um, so we know that in Judges 15, this is going to be um, after the, I guess, wedding feast or whatever it was in chapter 14. And in chapter, in chapter 15, um, Samson goes down at the time of wheat harvest. We established that this is uh, Pentecost. And that the offering, this offering of a kid is a Pentecost offering, at least it's in symbolic ways, it would tie in with that. Um, but he finds that his wife has been given in marriage, right? And then we're going to, Samson is going to enact revenge. Um, so he catches 300 foxes, however he does that. I have no idea. Uh, and then he's going to take, put, uh, firebrands between these foxes when he ties them tail to tail. And and then he's going to have this firebrand in the midst between the two tails. So one of the things we can say is this is re representative of a chiasm. Uh, the first chiasm that we see with 300 is the 150 days of the water prevailing and the 150 days of the water abating in the story of Noah, right? And we obviously see this 300 in other places. We have the 300 years. Um, and, and we're going to look at a couple of Stephen's charts just uh, uh, relating to some of this chronology as well. Um, and we know there's the 300 years that it talks about that they could have re recovered the lands, uh, the people of Moab. Um, or is it, uh, is it the Moabites, the Ammonites? Anyway, they could have recovered the land. They have 300 years to do that. And, and there's also the 300 years uh, of the temple being, or the sanctuary, the temple, the tabernacle, uh, the ark being in um, Shiloh that Ellen White references. And these are chronological issues, but they're symbolic at least in the sense that we have 300. 300 is... Uh, this number that's in the story of Gideon. We also know that Ellen White refers to the 276 people on the ship in Acts 27 as 300. So it's a rounded up number. Um, and uh, so we can tie the 300 to the 273. 
So there's lots of these, these symbols here. They sort of come together in the context of uh, the symbols in our time. And um, so he's going to burn up the shocks, the standing corn, the vineyards, and the olives of the Philistines. And we talked about this, that this refers to the system of study, the doctrine, uh, which is <clears throat> something that affected this movement. And so that helped us place these things on a timeline and what's actually happening in our movement. Um, and then uh, we're going to have this issue with the, the slaughter, right? And then we know that Samson's going to be uh, bound and delivered to the Philistines. <clears throat> uh, but he's going to break that binding, which is uh, um, going to be these cords. Right? He burnt, just breaks them as flax. And he takes the jawbone of an ass and he kills a thousand men with this. And then he's going to have this, um, <clears throat> this place. Um, so the word Ramoth Lehi. Lehi refers to this um, jawbone, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what we determined yeah. earlier. And so when God clave a hollow place that was in the jaw, that is, we're taking that as being in Lehi, so not in the jawbone itself. Right? That was the other... That's what we de determined, yes. And... Um, which is how Young's Literal translates it. So it's the place, the location. And... Um, so we, we kind of had addressed that point, um, but we're going to have to come back to that to try to place these verses on this line. And then, of course, we're going to have the story of Samson and Delilah, right? So that's going to be how we're going to place that story on the line is the next step. So I know we're just kind of jumping into it um, where we were at. Now we have drawn out this line here, so I'll just switch screens. And and this line is the line of Samson. <clears throat> so we had taken this period of darkness, the birth of Samson being uh, the arrival of the first message. We put that as nine eleven. And then um, we have this increase of knowledge in chapter 13. Chapter 14 is going to give us 11.9. And um, the period of days there is uh, 110 times 62. So whatever the number was, 5,000. Uh, number again. 6,634, that's what it was. Uh, days from September 11th to November 9th, then the 252 days. Um, but we haven't put place the verses there. So how do we how do we get that the first angel is empowered on July 18, 2020? in this line of Samson, and what verses would we use to do that? So if we go back to 14, um, we have the lion roaring. That is going to be 11.9, and the lion roars at 9.11 as well. So from then on, we're going to have this riddle. So we would have to put the verses addressing this riddle. And that's going to be in relationship to July 18, 2020. Is there a particular verse that we would just take and, and place there? Are we just going to take 
The verse where he gives the riddle is July 18, 2020, the riddle itself. Because that's going to be Judges 14, 14, the riddle. So is it okay if we just put that verse there? Well, it would be great to put that verse there. Now, the, the question that I would have, given the numbering of the verse. It's a doubling. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't that be the second angel arriving? Okay. So, so if we put this here, that's going to put the riddle related to December 25th, 2021. And I think that fits fine. Right. So then the empowerment of this, how does this relate to what happens before he gives the riddle? And how would we connect that to July 18? Now, we know it's hidden from his parents, right? Right. So is there anything we can do with that? Now, so one of the things that we have here in this story, though, is we have um, the 30, 30, 30. And, and that normally goes with the 252 and the 525, right? So when he gives this riddle, he's going to lay out these conditions. So... So could we say that this, because that's going to be the verses before he gives the riddle, right? So can we take um, Judges 14.11 to 14.13 as being the empowerment? That is, it came to pass when he saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said unto them, I will put forth a riddle unto you, if you can certainly declare it me within seven days of the feast and find it out. So one is we can take this um, period of time here and can we can we liken this period of time to seven days? Now of course I know that the riddle is going to be given at the beginning. But just as a symbol, we have the 30, 30, 30, right? And we, which gives us divided by 12, gives us these numbers. But can we put this here as seven days as a symbol that represents the 777 seven, seven structure? Well, that's in 4, 12, 14, 12, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be going from uh, 11, 12, and 13. I mean, I guess you could start it, um, you know, the feast, whenever the feast starts. But um, from 11 to 13, he makes this, yeah, this thing about there's the seven days of the feast. I'm going to give you these seven days to figure out this riddle. And so that's going to be, the riddle that we have to figure out, right? That's the 777 structure. When we get to the end of that, it's going to be followed by seven weeks. Okay. I would have, I, I'm not disagreeing with the symbology of this being seven days, mm -hmm. but I have to ask, as far as the application of verses, if Judges 14, 8 and 14, 9 might be a choice for the empowerment. Okay, he took thereof in his hands, went on eating, came to his father and mother. He gave no. them what? 14, 8. You were just reading 14, 9. 
Oh, okay. And after a time, he returned to take her and turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there's a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands, went unto, went on eating and came to his father and mother. He gave them and they did eat, but he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So you're saying just... Um, in the Millerite time frame, did they not have a message that was sweet in their mouth, but bitter in their belly? Mm -hmm. So here we have something that is sweet in the mouth. He shares it with his parents, doesn't tell them where it's from. And then uses that as the basis for the riddle. Okay. And then what you could do on this, because of 1414, you could go from 1410 to 1414 as your arrival. Okay, I like that better. And there's a number of reasons why. Because um, when it comes to uh, Pentecost, is there not first um, the first part, which is going to be seven days? Agreed. Okay, so we'll go like this and do that. All right, so you have the seven days, and then you have the seven weeks as the seven days is part of that seven weeks. I mean, you could say it's the eight days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Depends how you count it. Um, right? Okay, and then we're going to put 1414 as are we where are we going to put that? So um, here I'm going to do this. So you're saying that this first part, this is 14 verse 9 and 10. Or eight and nine, I mean. And then you're going to have that. <clears throat> um, you're going to have, no, I guess I could have left that there. Um, you're going to have that uh, 10 to, or 11, whatever, but we'll say 10 to 13. that make sense? And of course, that's going to be at the end of the 777 days that it's going to refer to these companions, right? The 30. And then you have the 30 changes of garment and um, the 30 Philistines that are going to be killed. It's going to be later. So... Does it make sense having that at the end of the 777 structure? So people understand what we're doing here. I mean, we have these dates and these dates are solid, but we're looking at which verses really exemplify those dates. Any thoughts? So now part of the problem that we're going to have here is we do have more verses. We have chapter 15 as well. So could we put all of these verses here? 
like that. Shouldn't have done that because I'm gonna need that. But anyway, people understand what I'm asking. So then chapter 15 is going to address this other history that we, we see in our movement, right? So in our movement, we have this issue dealing with, um, so we have the wheat harvest. So we're gonna put, see, so this is where, where I have the problem. So we got the wheat harvest, that's gonna be relating to this as well. So do we just double up these verses? Right, you understand what I'm saying? N not really. Okay, so when we get to chapter 15, it's going to address that wheat harvest. So we've already covered it in chapter 14 by putting these verses here. Now, maybe there's some way that we can combine all of those. So we have that seven days. It overlaps with the wheat harvest, right? So normally what I would do is I'd put 15.1. Oh, I guess we can do this here. So 15.1 is going to be here. That makes sense. Right? Because that's going to be chapter 15. That's going to be Pentecost. All right. Okay. So that does fit. So when we go to, I know it. Nice if I could share two screens at the same time. And uh, there's probably a way to do this. <clears throat> okay, so we got 15 ones. We have the wheat harvest. That's Pentecost, and so that's going to be the formalization of the second message. That is. If the second message is going to arrive at the beginning, so we're going to say that that where it begins is the wave sheaf offering. That seven days there represents the first seven days of this 49 days or 50 days, right? Of this seven weeks. And that's how we understood this. We understood that this was this relationship between uh, the end of the 777 structure and the presentation that Odilio does on February 12, 2022. It's seven weeks later. So that represents Pentecost. <clears throat> and we're also looking at this issue in chapter 15. Um, so what's going to, what's going to end up having here with the 300, how are we going to place the 300 in here now? Because you're going to have the 300. You're going to have this whole thing with Lehi. So we have to place this in this, this line. So we got two more waymarks. The, the, the sixth waymark is going to be that November 24th, 2022 date. That is an extension of time. And how do we attach that to all the symbols that are here in Judges 15? And then we have the arrival of the third angel. And that's going to be the first day of the 10th month, 
is the symbol there. Um, I have there that it's a harvest. That's what I have under it. I'm not sure. I can't remember why I put harvest under there. But that's the third angel arriving. And that's going to be the end of Colin's prediction. And that's going to begin the divorce. So how do we address Judges 15 in that context? Now, when we did the line before and we had Judges uh, 15 placed on a line, we had placed this at the first day of the 10th month. So I'll just go here, uh, back to the chart. So we had put the 300 foxes at January 11th and December 25th, 2022. Now remember, the whole story of Samson is a zoom in to those two dates, right? Correct. Okay. So, so we have this symbol of the 300 foxes that lie on um, this first day of the 10th month. So we're putting the first day of the 10th month as that that symbol. So that's going to be here. I'm just going to do it this way here. Both of those have that symbol attached to them. Now I put there that that's the wheat harvest, right? Though uh, technically we have, um, you know, I, I'm not sure why I put the wheat harvest there because the wheat harvest is. Oh, the wheat harvest, right? So that comes after. That's why. So we got Pentecost. Oh, and um, yeah. So why did I put the wheat harvest there? I can't remember. <clears throat> okay. So, so the 300 foxes, I mean, the way that we've placed it up above in that line, that was going to be wasn't a way more like it wasn't the third angel arriving, but we had the 300 foxes attached to those two dates that are there, uh, right? January 11th, 2023, and December 25th, 2022. So we have them down at the bottom as the first day of the 10th month, as the third angel arriving. That's where we place them. And we have the second angel is empowered at this November 11th, 22 date with that symbolic number of 2688 additional application for the additional extension of time. So how do we take Judges 15 and address this 300? Any thoughts? With what we're looking at, 300 being the foxes and the destruction. Yeah. So... Would we not be better to have 15.1 to 15.3 be the first portion? And then you've got this with 15.4. We just have to look at, at the, the ending portion because Samson is basically making his decision, 15.3, to do them a displeasure, as, as he's stating. 
Okay, so you want the second angel formalized as 15, 1 to 3? Correct. And then the 300 foxes you want to put as the empowerment? Correct. So that's going to be November 24th, 2022. Right. Okay. Um, it's just a thought. Yeah. Because well, 15, 4 to 15, 5... He's caught the foxes, and then he sensed the firebrands on fire. Okay. So it becomes light. Okay. Now, because we know what happens on November 24th as far okay. as um, – okay. So Ren has a statement, so we'll come back to that. Let's see. If the 300 are days, then the middle of the eighth day of the eighth month is the eighth day of the eighth month. That's um, also – 154 as in Snow's letters. Okay, so you have to explain that, Iran. Uh, well, for the first part, I guess, you know, so you'd measure from Pentecost for the beginning of the 300 days. And then okay. the one, for the 154, that's kind of different. That's talking about two periods of 77 days, I believe. Okay. So you're saying if we count from Pentecost on the biblical calendar, 300 days, you come to the eighth day of the eighth month. Uh, 150 days, because it's the middle. Would take oh, okay. okay, that makes more sense. Okay, so you're taking 150 days from Pentecost. It gives you the eighth day of the eighth month. Now, the 8-8 eight, eight becomes a symbol of the 88 days that go from um, the 20th day of the ninth month to the, uh, or pardon me, from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. That's the period of the divorcement. I'm sorry. 88 is the number of days for the divorcement. Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. I have 88, but I got a big question mark by it. <laughs> that just, answers that. From the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month, and 457 is 88 days. Okay. Because it was 29, 30, and 29 in that year for the 10th, 11th, and 12th months. So that adds up to 88. Um, so the eighth day of the eighth month is the middle. That means it's 150 days from Pentecost. So... Okay. Okay, so So this is going to be um which verses here? Dwight I believe it would be five and six. You when you hit, I'll look it up here real quick. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, it's just there's a lot of symbols here in this chapter. Four and five. 
Okay, four and five. Okay, and then we're going to have to take that whole story. Um, <clears throat> with uh, the Philistines wanting Samson. And we'd have to place it there at the third angel arriving. And then we'd have to kind of justify why we would do that. <clears throat> okay, so... Because when we look at these two dates, uh, December 25th, 2022, we know that's where we're going to start uh, this, this new study on the lines simply presented. And then we have, uh, of course, January 11th, the end of Collins' prediction. Uh, and uh, so that 25... 12 22 is the first day of the 10th month on the biblical calendar and january 11th is symbolically the first day of the 10th month in its connection with the period of time to april 5th 2030 so it's going to be 2640 days from that date and uh, an additional 18 days 2658 days and then when we take into account the November date, that's going to be 2,688 days. So you have this. These are, are things in our line connecting us to April 5th, 2030, right? That's mm. So that, that's, that's how we see this part of this story. So Judges 15 is giving us this connection. It's And, and it's tying us back to Ezra chapter uh, 7 to 10, right? Specifically chapter 10. So when we look at that second angel arriving uh, to the third angel arriving, we have that um, one year on our calendar. So we're going from biblical date, the 20th day of the ninth month. It's going to be 365 days to the first day of the 10th month. But in that whole story of the third angel arriving. So I think what, we, you know, it's not just the third angel arriving, though, right? I mean, that is in the in that. When the third angel arrives, there is a bunch of history connected together, right? You understand what I'm saying? In Millerite history, the third angel arrives. But then you're going to have this falling away, right? That happens after the third angel. And when we look at the fourth angel arriving, we can look at this as two different ways. So in Millerite history, you can look at the third angel arriving as being October 22nd, 1844. And the fourth angel arrives where? If you're speaking Millerite time or soon thereafter, wouldn't that be 1888? It would normally be 1863. Okay. Right. Because that's a rejection of the second angel, right? right? So, so, so we could do that, or we can say it's nine eleven, right? Right? Because that's how we did it. But we also know Ellen White sees it as the Sunday law. So. So when we look at this waymark, April 5th, 2030, so one is we have it as time within our line. 
And, you know, so the thing that I struggle with is, is this representing a falling away that happens? And if it's a falling away that happens in Millerite history, it's going to be 1863, right? Now, 1863 produces the 1863 chart, but it also establishes the Seventh-day Adventist Church and marks the end of a prophetic mirror. At least that 2,604-year prophetic mirror that's represented on the chart. So, you know, what we don't know is, is what's coming as far as, you know, this movement, how it's, how it's going to unfold, uh, how much time is involved. We have this April 5th, 2030 date, but it's, it's ambiguous. I mean, it could represent the Sunday law or events connected with the Sunday law in the future, um, but we wouldn't know what it means until after it passes. But it could even just represent still internal events within this movement. You know, when the movement finally comes together. And we in this line of Samson, because, you know, we could take all of these different chapters and put them on different lines. Um, you know, we're kind of saying, well, all of these chapters fit on this line. Right? But this third angel arriving is chapter 15, at least part of it. But this is going to be addressing the problem with with what? I mean, we're gonna have, so, so the Philistines, this is a response, right? And we're saying the Philistines represent an understanding of studying the Bible, right? Yes. Okay. So, you know, this isn't about people here. This just, I mean, people are connected to messages. But they're going to be saying, who is, who has done this, right? And they answered, Samson, the son of, son-in-law of the Timnite, because he hath taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. So, so when we look at these symbols here, um, Samson is still seeking vengeance. And so he's going to smote them hip, hip and thigh, and there's this great slaughter. And then he, he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock, Etam. And the Philistines went up, pitched in Judah, spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why are you come up against us? And they answered, divine Samson, are we come up to do to him as he hath done to us? And so there's 3,000 men of Judah that go unto the top of the rock, Eton, and say to Samson, um, knowest thou not? that the Philistines are rulers over us. What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, as they did unto me, so I have done unto them. So this represents something in our movement, in our message. It's a message in our movement. And this message allows itself to be bound, right? going to take this symbolism here but it's not going to hurt the men of Judah right um, and Samson's going to be delivered into the hand of the Philistines but he's going to break his bands and he's going to take this jawbone of an ass a new jawbone of an ass and use it as a weapon he's going to kill a thousand men with this Uh, we have this doubling heaps upon heaps. And then we're going to have this, um, this naming of this place. And then we're going to have that Samson is thirsty. 
uh, then there's going to be a hollow place in Lehigh. They're going to um, name this place here um, Fountain of One Calling, Ank Hakor, which is in Lehigh unto this day. And then it's just going to say he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. So that's a lot of stuff to place in a single way mark. Because <clears throat> there's so much symbolism there. Now, it could be representing a whole period of time in this movement that began on the first day of the 10th month. It could be marking the divorcement, which, of course, goes to April 5th, 2030. So how, how do we address this problem? What do we do with this? And then we still have uh, chapter 16. And, and chapter 16, um, there's a whole bunch of symbolism. I mean, tons of symbolism that, that definitely asks it to be an entire line, which I say is a repeat of history. But I could be wrong. I mean, it could be just the same history. But as far as the story of the judges, you definitely have these three chapters that can be the first, second, and third angel's messages. But each can be their own line. But Judges 16 would have to be the fourth angel if we're going to follow that pattern that we saw with the covenants. Any suggestions of what we should do with this? Now, there was a comment by Angela dealing with Judges 14, 15, 15, 6, and 16, 5 are connected. Um, so what do you mean by that, Angela? Because you got the seventh day, the riddle. Yeah, and there's an enticement, there's a burning. You know, like they, they threatened... Samson's wife with burning if she didn't reveal the, the riddle to them, and then they mm -hmm. fulfilled it. Right. And then and there's an enticement again in 16.5, so I just saw the ties. Whether they mean anything really important, I don't know, but I just okay. saw well, well, I, well, I think they do. I mean, that's one of the things we can see is that each of these chapters is, is repeating a line, right? Yeah. So... I mean, that's why we originally just dealt with each chapter as a line, that we never drew out a line for each chapter, which maybe we still need to do. But because um, I know I'm going to at least uh, try to figure that out at some point. I think that came into my mind, too, as I keep thinking of Judges 15.1 and the 151. And I thought, well, that's 1863 to 2014. Does that fit anywhere? I don't know these ideas come into my mind. I need some corroboration because. Okay. Well, you bring up. I don't know the foundation you have. <laughs> so you bring up 2014. And um, so one of the things we have with, with our lines that, that I'm going to address this afternoon. Uh, is that um, 2014 is an important waymark in our lines that we just generally ignore. And, um, and in understanding our lines, um, like 2014 uh, was marked 
in various ways at different times. So one is it was the prediction before midnight. Uh, we placed May 2nd, Samuel Snow's letters there. That's what was done by Tabo, which was really blessings. Um, and then we had uh, the July Samuel Snow's letters come up, right? And, and we had this 2014 to 2017 connection. And what we didn't understand is where we were in these lines, what line we were looking at a way market. Now, 2014 um, can be marked on different lines as a different way mark, right? Just like any way mark can. It can have uh, a place. So when we're dealing with, and so we're going to deal with that this afternoon. I'm not going to deal with it now. But when we're looking at these, these lines of Samson, and we talk about, well, we have a line. And it's just, we zoom into a way mark and we get this line of Samson. Now, the way that we've understood that is we're looking, we're zooming into this way mark that we call the first day of the 10th month. That's on our line of the judges. That is, it's the third angel arriving. And, and yet Samson is a very complex line because there's lots of lines here. Um, so if we're saying that this is the third angel arriving, it, it's actually the whole purpose of this line is to illustrate that third angel arriving. And it's doing so by taking the whole story of Samson. And so we end up with these different way marks in this line that are all, all about the third angel arriving. That is, that is the whole point of this line, the darkness in this line that re leads to this light has to do with a problem in our understanding of how we study the Bible. That is, there's a Philistine understanding of the Bible that is, the Protestant understanding of the Bible. Now, the thing that I find troubling, maybe is not the right word, um, but I'll just I'll just say troubling. Um, we have we don't realize how much we're like those that we envy, and. The way that I would understand it is that um, many in this movement are envious of the church. Uh, What's that, Angela? I just started laughing because I just don't see it. I mean, I'm thinking of, I don't envy the church at all. I pity the church. I have contempt for the church. I'm extremely disappointed in the church. Yeah, but well, that's not what I mean, right? So can you, yes, could you please try to explain what you mean? Because I'm having troubles constantly. Uh, okay. So I'm, just, this. I'm going back to my experience as a Seventh day Adventist that the people who are the most critical of the church, and, that's, and this movement is very critical of the church, right? that uh, much of that criticism comes from envy, not from knowing, wanting to do what's right. They would want to be in control of the church. And I've seen it happen. But wow. I've seen people okay. who are critical of the church, but when the church drew them in um, and they, 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 they got power in the church, then they were worse than the than those that they criticized. Or even if the church didn't draw them in, they acted worse than the church when they had their own movements, when they had their own churches, their own organizations. Right? So they could criticize the church. He that judges another man does the same thing. The thing that we often are so critical of 
represents something in our own heart. <clears throat> yeah, because we usually make the accusations against people that are that are actually like as Dwight puts it, we're pointing a finger at them, but there's three pointing back at us. And and our work is to be restorative, right? And and it's often supposed to be. And often what we do in our criticisms of the church and crit is is not in any way going to help the people that we're claiming to help by presenting what we call the truth. That is, it's 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 critical of individuals. It's not just a simple dispassionate analysis of of scripture. It's emotionally charged. Right. It's self-justifying. It's, you know, I'm not like that. Right. And we see this all the time in this movement. We see the church and others being talked about in a way that's <clears throat> that's mocking and boasting. You know, I'm thankful I'm not like other men are. You know, I fast right. by the tithe of all that I possess. And I'm not like this tax collector, right? So, so I mean, I've seen this my whole experience as a Seventh-day Adventist. I mean, I've kept an eye on it. I've seen people that um, that were critical of the church, and I've seen where their 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 path tends, and it's just doesn't doesn't go in a good direction. So it's always something that troubled me, you know, look at myself and I say, well, what is it that, what is it in me that uh, judges someone else whenever I have, uh, especially any kind of feelings, but they don't always have to even be feelings, just, just an attitude sometimes. Then I have to say, well, what is it in me that's causing that? Is this really healthy is this really the best way to look at it and you know i have to be honest that you know it's not always the best way to look at it so um and even the conflicts that have happened in this movement great temptations to just justify yourself and say well i'm in the right um because sometimes we are in the right in a certain sense but are we acting in the right so it's not about what we believe, what our, you know, what conclusions we draw intellectually. It's what are our actions doing? What are they ac accomplishing here? So, um, so when we look at what's happening in the movement, I mean, we have to come to the upper room. We're all agreed on that. And that upper room is, is not just people coming together and, you know, setting aside their differences, right? Disciples didn't just set aside their differences, right? No, they did not. You know, let bygones be bygones, you know, let's bury the hatchet, whatever, you know, type of phrase you can think of. Jones just kind of uses that. They have to be reconciled to God. In order to work together, in order for us to cooperate with others, we have to fall on that rock and be broken. Self has to be crucified. The dependence has to be upon what Christ is seeking to accomplish. We have to be cooperating with Christ. And, and I don't believe that any kind of organization can bring that about. You know, Heidi and I are in our readings. No. You know, we've been learning an awful lot in reading first nine testimonies and now into fifth testimonies. And Fifth Testimonies really starts off with uh, counsels to uh, some of the institutions, particularly at first the uh, educational institutions, Battle Creek College and so forth. And, I mean, you see all of these unconverted people running our colleges. And, and, and that's because unconverted people end up in top positions in institutions and organizations because they manage to push their way in. Mm -hmm. 
right? So, you know, so we can't, we can't afford to, you know, if we're looking at this April 5th, 2030 date as a parallel to 1863, I mean, is God just going to bring about the same things that happened in the past? Are we just going to continue to repeat this history? Is it just going to continually be the, um, one of failure? Or is this movement actually going to enter into that experience where the third angel is, is really empowered? Are we going to just have a falling away of our messages? Or are we going to be converted? And, of course, you know, we've talked about this many times, but the problem that I see is, is all of us, right? I mean, where the problem? We, we haven't learned anything. So how are we going to, to actually learn? What is God going to have to bring about in this movement for us to learn anything? You know, what's going to be left of this movement? You know, it, it, that's the thing that, that worries me the most. And, and we can see, you know, we've all made mistakes. We've all manifested things in our interactions with others that we wish we could take back. But if we look at these lines, I mean, we're going to say that this story of Samson and Delilah, this is, to me, about the victory of the fourth angel, right? Chapter 16 of Judges, Samson and Delilah, is, is illustrating something that's still coming in the, for this movement. But that, to me, seems to be in connection with the Sunday Law. It seems to be in connection with the accomplishment of this victory, And, and we can see this, so when we, we go to chapter 16 here and we're looking at this, and when we looked at this before, we're going to have this gate of the city. You know, this is going to be set upon a hill. So this movement, what, everything that we have learned, right? And Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city, the two posts, and went away with them bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Is this movement going to actually accomplish its task? Taking these truths, all of these things that we have learned from the scripture, all of these prophecies, and are we going to be able to set it upon a hill? Now, remember, Samson's moral aspects are uh, ironic. But if we look at this harlot, and Samson is a type of Christ, who is this harlot? All the souls that need Christ. Okay. Yeah, this would, this would be the church. And the church is a harlot. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. It's an unfaithful wife. It's an, right? Yes. Yes. So, so, so Christ is coming to, to save his people. And this is, of course, Samson is also a message, but he is a type of Christ. And so even though he's this bad character in some ways, morally, um, he's representing something good. And this is going to be, even though he's going to go through this whole experience, ultimately in the end, it's his victory. Right? So he's going to 
midnight, we're looking at midnight. Is midnight the Sunday law? I know it's a bad question. It depends on how it's approached. All right. If you look at 1844 and you look, you lay out the, the way marks, these seven way marks. And we, we look at this way mark we call midnight, right? And then we have the midnight cry and then we have the Sunday law, right? So I asked the question, is midnight the Sunday law? Well, it is. If you look at that whole line as the close of probation is the close of probation for the whole world. And the midnight cry lines up with the loud cry. And midnight then lines up with the Sunday. Right? So, so we must recognize that, that this is about the Sunday law issue. Samson chapter 6, or Judges chapter 16. The story of Samson and Delilah. And and there's a message. Theodore, I'm sorry, Theodore. Yep. What what um it says after the minute it says at midnight and took the doors of the gates of the city and the two posts. Mm -hmm. The doors, is that is that something like when Christ says that he um closes the door and no man opens and well, well, I take this as a two-leaved gate, right? So he's going to take the two-leaved gate, which represents a chiasm, with the two posts, right? So this is representing our message, the structural chiasms, everything that we've learned uh, about how, the, how to understand prophecy. That's the way that I understand this. Does that, that help? Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> Thank you. So they're going to be set up on the top of a hill. So in these final events, in these last days, this message has to be set up on the top of a hill. Now it says, and it came to pass Matthew. after. What's that, Angela? Well, I was just going to say the two-leaf gate is mentioned in Isaiah 45. One, it's about, about Cyrus. Yeah. I'll open before him the two leave a gate and the gate shall not be shut. Yeah. So we know that this, that's the same idea that's here, the same kind of symbol. And, and yeah, we haven't. And promises in four, four, two, and three uh, about making the crooked places straight, breaking the gates of brass and iron. So they're powerful promises there. I give thee the treasures of darkness, hidden riches of secret places, Falmon, Falmona. Yeah, and Cyrus is a type of Christ as well. So dealing with the two leaved gates. So, and then what's going to happen? So remember, it's ironic, morally speaking. So he's going to love this woman in the Valley of Sorek, whose name is Delilah. Right? Now, Delilah means languishing. It uh, comes from to slacken, to be feeble. And that would represent God's people. So even though this is, you know, Philistine woman, this is Christ coming to redeem the people at the end of the world through a message. Right? Um. Now, this whole thing dealing with this great strength, we can see that this is a repetition of the first, second, and third angels' messages. Um, that is, we're going to have, um, and we got to deal with that 1,100 pieces of silver and things like that as well. But um, uh, there's the seven green widths, right? These are these bowstrings. Um, there's going to be um, the ropes that have never been used, never been occupied. And then there's going to be um, the weaving machine, right? The pin and the beam and then the web 
right? His hair is going to be woven into this cloth. And then you're going to finally have the fourth, which is his hair being cut off, right? So you can say it's a 3-1 combination. The first three don't do anything to harm Samson, but the fourth does, right? That's a breaking of his Nazarite vow, but he's already broken the vow many, many times in lots of different ways. So um, so then he's going to be captured. And, and so, you know, it's really hard to just take um, Judges 16 without creating a line, which, which we're going to have to do, right? We're going to have to create this whole line and try to understand this line. But it has to be the fourth angel. And so the fourth angel contains a repetition of the first and second. And, and in some ways, this line chapter creates the line over and over. That is, it's repeat and enlarge. Can we agree that the death of Samson is the Sunday law? And if, if it's the Sunday law, how can we say the death of Samson is the Sunday law? Would it not be the close of probation? Okay. Okay, explain. Well, uh, we're given wants to die in judgment. Yeah, okay, so he's going to die, right? Okay, so that. That makes sense. Any other thoughts? And we can see that there's going to be 3,000 men and women um, on the roof, right? Yeah, Lord. Samson is a message, right? Yep. Well, if he if he dies, does that kill the message? No. No. No, it wouldn't kill the message. You know, Samson accomplishes his mission, right? So in, in some ways, I could see how this would be uh, the close of probation. But there's a lot attached to this death of Samson. Because what we see is we have this, to me, this is uh, Elijah on Mount Carmel, but, you know, it's a bit more ironic than that, right? Because you have the lords of the Philistines gathered them together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their god. And rejoice, for they said, our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. Now, maybe this we could put as later. But I would look at this conflict in the great controversy that comes to pet that, that uh, culminates with the Sunday law. But maybe this is the Sunday law that we would call the, the death decree Sunday law. You know, it happens after the close of probation.
which is the first Sunday law that Ellen White points out. She doesn't bring in the, the national Sunday law until quite a bit later. So when she first talks about the Sunday law, she's first talking about the Sunday law after the close of probation. And later she brings the Sunday law before the close of probation. But this is a, a conflict between truth and error, right? And then we have these pillars. So what are these pillars? He's set between two pillars. As I believe, as we talked initially, the truth between two pillars is the fact that pillar one was Sunday sacredness, pillar two was the state of the dead. Right. So we can look at these two pillars, which are the issues at the end of the world, right? Right. Correct. Yeah. And and this is this is also a chiasm in a sense, too, right? With this message in the center. So you can see there's so much in this story of Samson, right? To just, you know, to take chapter 16 and just say, well, you know, that's the fourth angel arriving. Uh, I mean, I really think we have to draw out this line and we have to, we have to finish each of these lines, I think, as individual, each of these chapters as individual lines. But, but I think that this, this chapter, chapter 16, at least contains three different lines repeating um, this history in some way. You know, maybe we could put it all into one line, but I, I think there's more than one line here. And, you know, part of our problem is we've delved so deeply into the symbolism here. Um, you know, because even when we go back to, you know, this, this first part of this uh, chapter, right? I mean, you're going to have all of these symbols for midnight. Um, uh, you're going to have these chiasms. The 1100 pieces of silver we dealt with before. Um, we have a repetition of those three angels' messages with the fourth. So that itself must be a line. You know, and how do we place that? Do we just place it? Where is that line in our history? Like what events, what dates are being marked? And, and do we just look at it in a very narrow sense? Do we bring it out uh, representing our entire line? And, and then we have to remember that, that this fourth angel arriving, we're placing around the April 5th, 2030 date as this way mark, which we don't know what it means yet. Other than it's the end of the divorcement. And it's uh, represented by this application for the additional extension of time. Are we getting anywhere with this? With Samson? I mean, I think it's going to take a bit of time for us to get this. Yes, it is going to take some time, but I think we've made progress. Okay. Oh, man. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, and, and, and the study this afternoon, I'm going to bring up some stuff that uh, deals with our lines, answering a question that someone asked me uh, from Vietnam. And uh, uh, oh, one other thing we should look at here. I want to just look at Judges 1629. 
Because remember the 1629, where did we attach this? There's 1629 days and 1629 weeks, and we attached it to what date? Had to do with the church being founded. I think it was May 23rd, 1863. No, no, no. But it has something to do with the uh, the books that were new books of the order in 19 in 1620. No, no, no. We had it as a symbol. So first, this symbol comes from Odilio, right? February 12th, 2020. His presentation introduces this 1629 symbol and he's going to attach it to uh to number 1629 right and so when he does number 1629 he is going to attach that to that span of time right because he's going to um wait no he's going to attach that to this con he's going to attach it to the pandemic right to the mandates and, and then he's also going to use Leviticus 16.29, I believe. Or is it Exodus 16.29? So, um, well, maybe both. Yeah, well, he only chose two, numbers and one of the others, and then I chose the other one. You want to read that verse? Uh, yes, it shall be a statute forever unto you in the seventh month on the tenth day of the month. You shall that's, in, that's in no, Numbers 16. No, 1629 uh, in Numbers. I'm reading Leviticus right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, shall do no work at all, whether one of you be of your own country or a stranger or sojourner that among you. Uh, this is going to be about the Day of Atonement. Um, and then... Exodus 16.29 was, um, see, for the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he hath given you this in the sixth day the bread of two days. Right? So this is going to be in connection with the first time that the manna is given. And um, the number 16.29 was the one dealing with whether they die the common death of all men. So he was trying to attach that to uh, to the mandates. Um, so, where this is about Koradath and Abiram and their rebellion, right? So, I didn't quite see his connection there, but he was just dealing with this death part of it. Um, so, anyway, the 1629, where I wanted to go, was that we connected this to November. 24th, 2022, that is, um, we had the 1629 days from June 9th, 2018 to November 24th, 2022. And then the 1629 weeks from November 24th, 2022, back to 9-11-91, the, the misdated a world new world order speech of George Bush that was actually um, <clears throat> 12 days later that was September 23rd 1991 that he actually made that new world order speech um, now there is the new world order speech on September 11th 1990 one year earlier right <clears throat> um So there's all of these, uh, these, this 1629 deals with November 24th, 2022. The point is this um, 1629 in Judges, and I'm going a bit over, thought it'd be quicker. Uh, so the 1629 in Judges is um, these, uh, Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up and the one in his right hand and the other in his left. Now, what does this remind us of? Do 
Doesn't this remind us of Daniel chapter 12? Good point. Right. So I think of that and, of course, Revelation chapter 10. So he's going to swear it shall be for a time at times and a half a time to scatter the power of the holy people, right? And in Revelation 10, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, it just says he lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, etc. that time there should be time no longer. Right, and then Revelation 10, 7, the voice of the seventh angel begins to sound, October 22, 1844, on the tenth day of the seventh month. So um, to me, there's a tie here between um, all of these things in the story of, of Samson that we have to, we have to really sort out. Um, So I don't, I don't, don't have the answer to it. All I do know is that this line of Samson is going to lead us to April fifth, twenty thirty. We still don't know what that means. Okay, so that should be good. Any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay. Not from me. Dear Father in heaven. Thank you for the study uh, this morning. Be with us through the rest of the day in our study in the afternoon. Uh, we ask, Lord, that um, you can help us to understand these things that we struggle with and that they can give us strength, power, conviction in our personal lives as we a battle with the forces around us seeking to discourage us. And uh, we pray for one another. H help us, Lord, to be encouraging. And um, um, we pray, Lord, that you can do a work, mighty work, upon each soul's heart. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.